welcome to the Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Tuesday, March the 30th, 2021. On this edition of the Politocrat, a look at the first day of the trial of Derek Chauvin. You'll be hearing from one or two of the witnesses not in any length, but there will be one I will focus on. And on this episode, the words of President Biden, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, and Dr. Anthony Fauci about getting vaccinations, about achievements so far, and about fears for massive, massive reinfections thanks to new waves, as they are called. This is an episode you really must listen to. Coming up next. Welcome back. Actually, I want to start with a couple of corrections. Just now, in the introduction, I talked about reinfections. Well, I definitely misspoke there, and I apologize for misspeaking and being completely incorrect. It's not reinfections. It's a wave of new, N-E-W, new infections that was expressed yesterday And I'll be playing some of that audio, actually, where you can actually hear it for yourself during the White House COVID-19 task force briefing, which, as you may know, happens three times a week, typically Monday, Wednesday and Friday of every week. There was an admission today from Dr. Rochelle, actually yesterday, excuse me, Dr. Rochelle Walensky. Unless they're having a briefing today, again, (laughs) that I am not aware of. So I don't know why I would um, say that since I just said to you that it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But yesterday in the briefing, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, she is the director of the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, said that she had some real fears. I'll definitely get to that audio for you a little bit later. But it is not reinfections, it is a wave of new infections that she she expressed some real fear about. So I just wanted to make sure I get that correct myself, and I apologize for um, being incorrect and um, perhaps misleading you uh, in my misspeaking there uh, at the start. The other thing I want to do in the way of correction is to actually go back about two or three episodes to something that I got incorrect. And that was the name of an author of a book. And I also got part of the title of the book wrong. I got the main title of the book correct, which was the most important thing. But maybe not, because I got the name of the author wrong, and that certainly would be handy to get the name correct. And I was talking in the context of social media. If you listen to... Sunday's episode, you will perhaps recall that I talked about communication on social media and how there are times when people are listening to you and then there are times where people are not listening to you or you definitely feel that they're not listening to you. And I went into detail with a couple of examples of this. And I had cited that a few people had left Twitter. There were authors who had left, celebrities who had left, film uh, persons who had left Twitter and decided, look, I don't want to be on this platform anymore. I talked about Chrissy Teigen, who last week formally ended her Twitter presence, took down her account and suspended and said, goodbye, sayonara, I'm done. And, you know, there are more and more people, it seems, who are doing this, prominent or not. And one of them, as I was talking in the episode a couple of days ago, was 
the author that I mispronounced the name of, Ijeoma Oluo, is the correct pronunciation, I believe, of her name. Ijeoma Oluo is the author of the book Mediocre, the subtitle The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America. Ijeoma Oluo had said on Twitter that she, and she's a black woman, had been under real attack. And I don't remember if she said if it was via email, which I think she did mention, or by Twitter or all of the platforms, which I would imagine it would not stop at just email and only email. It would also be anything else because black women, as I've said, are the most targeted people on social media for negative comments toward them, for racist comments, misogynoirist comments, misogynistic comments. So Ijeoma Aluo was saying a few weeks ago that she really is going to look at ending her Twitter account. And it seems as if that's what has been happening or is going to happen and because and she cited all of the things that I've just talked about this abuse and misogynistic uh, I can't even say it now misogynoirist behavior and all of that kind of thing that is just so poisonous and toxic and dangerous and does not help anybody at all It just fosters an atmosphere of hatred. And that's that. I mean, if you go to Ijeoma Luo's Twitter handle, it's still up. But she's not posted anything after March the 10th of this year. So that was what, two weeks ago now, two and a half weeks ago. And if you click on her web page... Uh, well, you see here her web page is open, so that's good news because the last time I checked it, her web page was closed. She absolutely canceled it. Looks to me like she has uh, restored it, so that's good news. Um, Ijeoma Aluo is available on her web page, um, and since she has reactivated it. I certainly will give that out now. I-J-E-O-M as in Mike, A-O-L as in living, U-O dot com. Ijeoma Oluo. That's I-J-E-O, M as in mountain, A as in apple, O as in October, L as in love, U as in underscore, and O as in orange.com so there you go those are the two corrections and I apologize for um, getting the information incorrect and misspeaking as well so that is that and I want to go now to well the following thing actually which is no I don't even want to get to the trial of Derek Chauvin just yet But I want to say something to you, dear listener, and that is I want you to think about the thing that you've always wanted to be, the person that you've always envisioned yourself to be. You may well be there right now with yourself. And I'm not necessarily talking about the good qualities that you ascribe to or that you have or that you want to improve on or want to attain or get to. I'm talking about the kind of person you want to be in life. What is that person and who is that person? And what does that person look like? And I want you to envision who that person is and I want you to become that person. It takes time. And I'm not talking about role playing and being someone else. I'm talking about being the person that you have always wanted to be. Can you identify who and what that person is for you? I think that's something I want to leave with you um, to ponder. Think about who you want to be as a person, who you 
aspire to be or want to be or are trying to become. And I'm not talking about comparing yourself to someone else or some celebrity. I'm talking about what kind of human being do you want to be in your life? And again, I'm not even talking about good qualities or this. I'm talking about the kind of person, meaning what kind of thing in life are you doing? What kind of work are you doing in life at the moment? And I'm not talking about unemployment, employment, or whatever you might call it. I'm talking about what kind of thing are you doing in your life right now? The person you want to be. Maybe I've made this question a little bit too pointed. Maybe not. Maybe it's... um, Too vague? I don't know. But I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the kind of person that you want to be. I want you to become that person. And as I say, it will take time. But I promise you that I will launch right into day one of the Derek Chauvin trial. And that's coming up right after this. Day one yesterday of the Derek Chauvin trial, which ended, by the way, with a feed that got interrupted so that those of you like me who watch the coverage on C-SPAN 2 here in the United States were left with a complete color bar at the end of the session, in fact, before it ended. So we missed some of the testimony of one of the witnesses. Donald Williams was his name, and I must say he was a rather compelling witness Um, He was the standout witness for day number one. And I must say he was very impressive. At times he volunteered a lot more information than was necessary. Very loquacious sort. He loved to talk. And to the point at which the judge and the prosecuting uh, ADA had the assistant district attorney had been telling him to abbreviate his responses because he was so long winded at times. And I think there was a real zeal and enthusiasm that he brought um, to his testimony and to the proceedings, even though, of course, it was also very somber. And he also spent a lot of time talking about some of the very graphic things that he observed and some of the things that he himself trained for and trained to avoid as someone who was in mixed martial arts and still is, and someone who has fought in professional fights and has experienced losing consciousness and being what he called choked out. And a number of other things I found uh, to be rather interesting, fascinating, but also deeply disturbing as well. And I won't play all of those for you in this clip, but I will, um, in this clip coming up, but I will play a short bit of what he had to say about his whereabouts and where he was in relationship to what he saw vis-a-vis Derek Chauvin sitting with his knee on the neck of George Floyd, who, again, I must reemphasize to you, as you all know, was handcuffed handcuffed with at least two other, if not three other police officers holding him down or sitting on him at the, at the same time that Derek Chauvin had his knee in the neck of George Floyd. I mean, this is, again, as I said in yesterday's episode, this was barbaric and it was an execution. It was slow motion torture to death. It was deadly torture. And there's no doubt in my mind and in your mind that Derek Chauvin did this. The question is, will he pay the price for it? And I left you with a question during one of the breaks from yesterday's episode asking you if you thought that Derek Chauvin would be convicted 
of the charges. And you know I, how I felt about those charges to begin with. Unintentional second degree murder. That's a bunch of nonsense. Unintentional. When it was clear that, and I said eight minutes and 46 seconds, it was nine minutes and 29 seconds that he did this for. I mean, it was very clear. This was not unintentional at all. It was deliberate and it was intentional, which means he should have got first degree murder. And if there was some sort of thing as second degree intentional murder, then he should have got that as well. There's just no question about it. It was very compelling yesterday's day one. I thought that the prosecution, I mean, it's early doors yet, as it were, in the early going. I thought the prosecution did what it was expected to do, what it had to do. Nothing flashy, no must, no fuss, nothing of this tremendous consequence. No fire and brimstone. They know what this moment is and they know that the entire world is watching. So they didn't have to play any theater. They just did their procedural job. And I think in the end, that was the best way to go on day one. Now, they may change that today as the proceedings are already underway. And by the time perhaps you listen to this, they may have completed for Tuesday. But we'll see um, how things go as we are underway now. Um at day number two of the trial of Derek Chauvin. And I I really, um, (laughs) you know, I I just don't really think that the prosecution can do anything else but just present the case that they have, present the evidence, present the facts, have the witnesses, and just do what they have to do. And as long as they present their case the right way, well, that's not a guarantee that the jury is going to do what the prosecution and the world, the vast majority of it anyway, wants them to do. We'll see how it plays out. But I want you to Well, before I say this, um, there were two other witnesses, the dispatcher who was on the line, who spoke up because she saw something or thought something was very wrong with the way um, one of the response cars, which was the car with Chauvin and the other cops uh, was behaving. And also the former, now former convenience store clerk across the street from where everything happened Um, was also a testifier. She came across, I guess, I mean, as someone who perhaps didn't care. But she did care. And she, I'm sure some people, and even I for a few seconds thought, well, gosh, she seems to have a little bit of an attitude. But the fact is, I snapped back to attention immediately after I thought that because... The fact of the matter is, is that she was probably very terrified and just really did not want to be there to testify in a case against a killer who, even if he's no longer on the force, has plenty of contacts on it right now. So I didn't think her testimony was... um, going to be a make or break but the reason she certainly seemed a little bit nervous at best um, if not downright terrified was because of the moment because she knows that millions of people around the world are literally watching her speak I mean this trial is being televised online is being televised in other countries Sky News in the UK had the trial on and it will for the for the duration. And other countries around the world are, are streaming it or showing it live on television. I think in Australia they're doing it live as well. So this is going all over the world. 
So there's a lot going on. And also, not only is there a killer in the courtroom staring at this young woman who really just didn't want to be there. You could just tell she did not want to be there. But also there is history. And one, I believe his name is Joshua Brown. Last year or the year before, might have been 2019, because it would have had to have been, was killed within a few days after he testified against the killer cop Amber Geiger in a courthouse in Texas. You may remember that Amber Geiger killed Botham John in his own apartment. So there is plenty of precedent for witnesses who testify against police being killed later on. It happened just again about a year or two ago. So I really would caution those and even myself for a split second before I snap to attention um, into thinking that when you see witnesses and you may note that they seem maybe perhaps a little bit put off or lack, lackadaisical or you may characterize them as having an, an attitude that you should really think again about that and that maybe what you think is an attitude is actually someone manifesting behavior that reflects how terrified they are of the situation that they're in as witnesses. And I don't know if she had to be subpoenaed. I don't know if she came across on her own volition. My sense is, is that she was probably subpoenaed to come in to testify. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe she wanted to come in, but of course, as it goes with these things, as the days draw closer and the time to testify comes, you know, you get cold feet. And you're afraid. I mean, that happens, doesn't it? Of course it does. So I didn't think that she added a lot to the proceedings. The paramedic pro forma for me as well. I didn't really think there was a whole lot there. But I must say the third and final witness of yesterday was Donald Williams. And I thought that he was very important. And until the feed was cut off all of a sudden on places like Court TV and in fact in the closed circuit rooms adjacent to the courtroom where this case is unfolding in Minneapolis. Until that happened, you know, I thought Donald Williams was by far the most important and the best witness of the day. I think his only issue was is that he talked too much. <laughs> I mean, I really think that he um, did a lot of talking about things and a lot of exposition and explanation on things that I don't know that the, the uh, excuse me, the uh, trial attorney, the, the prosecutor was really looking for. But certainly um, with a little bit of steering and the prosecutor eventually did that, I thought that uh, Donald Williams was a very compelling witness, very persuasive. And um, this is the first witness really that the prosecution had put forward who really has brought something um of of value. I mean, not that the others didn't, but but he's someone who was directly on scene. Now, the former store clerk, the convenience clerk, she was actually in the building across the street, video recording, but she was not outside on the ground on scene where Donald Williams actually was. Donald Williams is the first witness who has come uh, before the court who was directly there watching on the street, literally a few feet away. He was less, he was probably five feet away from George Floyd, literally five feet away. And he talked about looking the officer in the eye and the off, and officer Chauvin, now Derek Chauvin, no longer a cop, was looking him in the eye too, in the, in the eye too when he talked about a chokehold. And this is a blood choke, which is the thing that he said that really, uh, shook and stirred me um, and not positively in any way, shape or form. Um, 
Donald Williams was a really good witness, very compelling, very powerful at times, very humorous at times, very charismatic at times, and, and very detailed and loquacious. And, you know, he did talk a whole lot, which, um, you know, I think he should have been contoured a bit more. But nonetheless, even in his extemporaneous um, responses, he supplied a lot of information to that jury. You don't know how this is going to play out, and nor do I, um, except to say, I mean, in terms of what the jury's actually thinking. Uh, but I do have my thoughts about whether or not there's going to be a conviction, and I definitely am not expecting there to be one. I'll put it that way. Not expecting it. History has told me too much about that in terms of convictions of murdering black people. That is just, in the United States of America, don't hold your breath, particularly if it's a white person, only especially if it's a white person who's accused of doing it or is on trial for it. Because normally, white people do not even go on trial for this, especially if they're police officers. This is just not a thing for cops. I should really make it clear. I mean, that's just... It's just not going to happen. I mean... But we'll see. We'll see if I have to eat a hat or something, you know. But I want to play this from Donald Williams. And I warn you, um, you will find, I think, some of this to be distressing listening. I'm not going to be playing any of the audio of those nine minutes and 29 seconds, parts of which were played during the time that Donald Williams was on the witness stand. But I will be talking, or rather playing, some of the testimony where Donald Williams is talking, I think, in quite graphic terms, even though um, he doesn't necessarily use words that appear to be that graphic, but he does set a vivid picture. And so that is something you will be hearing. So I do warn you that you may find this to be distressing or disturbing or both. Um, this whole testimony and this whole trial, obviously, is one that will bring up a lot of the things that happened 10 months ago. But can you imagine, by the way, George Floyd's family? They're reliving this every day. Every single day they're reliving this. And they're going to relive it every single day for the rest of their lives. So for every time you feel, oh my goodness, this is too much, I can't listen to it. Think about what George families, George families, yeah. Think about what George Floyd's family is feeling. Think about what they're experiencing right now. Think about that. The feed had actually gone out during, again, Donald Williams' testimony and some of the families, and I suspect the families being George Floyd's family and maybe even Chauvin's, but because they're not allowed inside the courtroom, so they're in an adjacent room watching on closed-circuit televisions. I'm sure that the parties are separated into two separate rooms, and so apparently they could not get all the whole feed of the testimony either. So Donald Williams is going to be um, testifying right now. In fact, he's testifying at the moment. And um, I suspect he's going to be testifying for quite a bit longer. We'll see. Well, it depends. Probably, I can't imagine he'd go to toward Wednesday and still be testifying. But it depends. I mean, if we have another interruption with the feed... Um, closing down for at least 10, 15 minutes. And then the judge decided to, uh, yesterday, let the jury out uh, about an hour earlier than he, I guess, was going to. Then you, you don't know, half hour to an hour earlier. You don't know. I don't know what would happen. But the point is, is that, you know, that's that's what happened toward the end of the day yesterday. And it was immensely frustrating. Although on court TV, you could have watched the entire thing without interruption. There were so many networks covering this here in the United States live that, my goodness, you could have really uh, found it hard not to see this trial in some way. 
I mean, this is going to be the focus for at least another month. There are expected to be around 400 witnesses, so this is going to be a very busy situation here. But let me get to Donald Williams. Here's um, Donald Williams yesterday, day one, talking to the prosecuting attorney, I believe it is. Well, I don't want to get his name wrong, so I'm not going to say his name. But he was also quite charismatic, I thought. I think that the prosecution team are rather charismatic, interestingly enough, or unless that's just a case of Minnesota nice, as they call it there. Um, But there's an African-American prosecutor, two white prosecutors. The African-American prosecutor um, laid a few things out that I thought to be of uh, benefit. Um, But really, it was the attorney who was speaking to Donald Williams, who I thought was quite charismatic and I thought uh, procedural, did what he had to do. And I think that's really what the defense has to do. Um, Excuse me, the prosecution. The defense was just, I'm not even going to go into the victim blaming and the um, racist comments, you know, the racist stereotypes that the defense attorney for Derek Chauvin was alluding to and making clear, oh, he was a threat, oh, he had drugs, that kind of garbage, that racist garbage, you know, that not, that is not said to a white person when they are killed. So anyway, I'm not even going to get into that kind of garbage. There's, I'm sure, a million podcasts that will, but this is not one of them. So I'm going to um, play this now. Donald Williams is about two or three minutes long or so. Um, this is from yesterday. Now I'm going to show Exhibit 17 on the screen. And I, okay. and um, so this is what you saw when you uh, came to that area on the curb there. Yeah, this is what I saw. And the only reason why he's looking at me right now is because uh, I told him it was a blood choke. Okay. We will come back to that in a in a little bit. Um, when you um, were there, was Mr. Floyd able to speak? That is correctly. Um, he was speaking in a distress way. And uh, what kinds of things led you to believe he was distressed? Uh, he was vocalizing it to the officer. He said, my stomach hurt, I can't breathe, my head hurts, I want my mom. Uh, and um, Yeah, those are the things that he repeatedly said. He wanted to get out the car. He said he's sorry for what he did. He pleaded with my mans and told him, like, I'm sorry. I shouldn't pretty much have to die. And so did you feel like you could have walked closer from this vantage point on the curb? I could have. I felt that way in in, in a way, but it's a a, a fear factor as well. And at this time, so you had seen Officer Tao, and you had seen this officer in Exhibit 17. Correct. On Mr. Floyd. Did you see any any other officers at the scene at that time? No, I did not. All right. And so this, in Exhibit 17, shows the vantage point you had, the view you had from where you were standing. Correct. I only had that side view of the two officers and the the shoulder length of George Floyd's head. Nothing else. And um, when you were in this location, can you describe uh, for the jurors what you saw about Mr. Floyd, how he appeared? Well, let me back up just for a second. You've used Mr. Floyd's name. Did you know him at the time? I did not know Mr. Floyd at all. No real connection. So you're using his name because you've learned since then who he is. Correct. I can't go to many places without not knowing his name or seeing his face. So when you're in this location, you first come up and you're seeing him, he's able to speak. Correct. Can you describe what you saw of Mr. Floyd's condition as time progressed here? Um, As time progressed, so when I first, like I said, when I first arrived on the scene, Mr. Floyd was vocalizing his... uh, his sorriness and his pain and his um, distress that he was going through. Um, the more that his the knee was blockly circ- uh, on his neck uh, and shimmies were going on, the more you seen Floyd 
fade away, slowly fade away. And like the fish in the bag, you seen his eyes slowly, you know, pale out and again, slowly roll to the back of his eyes. And he, um, so this is what I seen, this is what I heard. And that's how, you know, what it was like, he was going through the stress because of the knee and he vocalized it that I can't breathe. I need to get up and I'm sorry. And his eyes slowly rolled to the back of his head. You seen the blood coming out of his nose. You heard him tell me, tell him before he stopped speaking that my stomach hurts. And those most of the time is the last bowel movement of your life. So from there on, he was lifeless. He didn't move, he didn't speak. He didn't have no life in him, no more on his body movements. During that time period, did you notice anything about his breathing that was significant to you? Yes, so uh, just like in MMA, you could tell when someone gets tired or you could tell when someone's getting choked out or things like that. His breathing was getting tremendously heavy and tremendously harder for him to breathe. And you actually could hear him. You could see him struggling to actually gasp for air. Um, while he was trying to breathe. And I mean, he barely could move while he was trying to get air. As you were um, standing there, um, did others gather around? Correct. Uh, at the moment, I was the most vocalist person out there pleading for Floyd's life because I felt like it was definitely in a room. And um, there was at one point in time, a medic came on scene and she spoke on checking pulse would made me even go even more harder because I heard it and then I registered it and it like, oh, you do need to check his pulse. Oh, he is not moving. Like, oh, you just killed this man, you know? And so her expertise was like, look, he's fading away. You need to check his pulse. She's asking him multiple times. I'm asking him multiple times. No one checked his pulse. Do you remember Officer Tao saying anything um, uh, during this time period? Yeah, he um, he did what an American does and he blamed it on drugs for being a black man on the ground. Uh, let, me, let me just tell you. Sorry about that, yeah. yeah. What, what did he say about drugs? He said, this is what drugs do to you. And I replied, this is not what drugs do to you. Donald Williams there, and wow. Whew. Yeah, I mean, this was this is a very, very heavy situation and you're going to be hearing more of this those of you who are watching this trial you're going to be hearing more of this it's a very traumatic experience to be sitting and watching or listening to that trial Um, but again as I say as traumatic as it might be for you or for me or for anyone else watching um, the video or watching the testimony or any of you listening to me hearing me talk about it and playing Uh, audio excerpts, just remember that there is a family who is reliving this every single second of every single day. And they don't have the luxury of being able to go out with their friends or their family to celebrate getting vaccinated or anything like that. They don't have that luxury because George Floyd is no longer with their family. Think about the family of George Floyd whenever you look at the accounts of things on and during this trial and think about what they are going through because unless you have experienced loss, you have absolutely no idea. you are well. I hope you are managing to get through what is going to be these final few days of March as we wind down and head into April. One thing I want to get to quickly before going into President Biden's speech a little bit from Monday. Yes, he did give a speech approximately 13 minutes or so on Monday talking about vaccinations and the successes, touting them quite rightly, uh, which I think is a good thing. Um, but I do want to get to a couple of things. I recommend um, some books to you, and I will recommend them again as we wind down this portion of Women's History Century for March. Um, first of all, I do recommend Angela Davis's autobiography. It's called An Autobiography by Angela Davis. 
and also the book Women, Race and Class, also by Angela Davis, Professor Davis. And you know that Angela Davis is a freedom fighter, a former political prisoner, a professor, I believe, at um, she was once at Sandy at San Francisco State. Um, she's professor, I think, in Santa Cruz right now, UC Santa Cruz. Um, I'm not quite so sure. Um, and she's still, uh, well, she continues to lecture and do all kinds of great things. I mean, she's such a, I mean, inc- incredible human being, uh, Angela Davis. I would love to speak to her here on this podcast. Um, but, I, you know, she's just really important. And she's written these two fine books. She's written more than two books. She's written at least, I think, close to a dozen books, if not more. Um, Angela Davis, Professor Davis, is really someone that you've got to acquaint yourself with. And these are the two two of her best books, I'd say, that you should really acquaint yourselves with. One of them is called An Autobiography, so that, you know, it's fairly self-explanatory. And the other is called Women, Race, and Class. I think that's a very, very good title, and the book is very good indeed. So I do recommend both of those highly. Now, yesterday, President Joe Biden gave a speech and announced that um, by April 1st, at least 90, this is incredible, at least 90 not 90 million, but 90% of Americans will be having access to the vaccine within five miles radius from where they live, which I think is really impressive. And he also said that 90% of American adults will be eligible for vaccination by May 1st. Now, that's a very impressive thing, too. Yet you do have to dig a little bit to look for the fine print. And the fine print is the word eligible. Because eligible does not mean guaranteed. And eligible may mean that, oh yes, you meet the requirements, uh, make an appointment for the vaccine vaccination. But then you've still got to wait maybe a week, two weeks, three weeks for an appointment. Depending on where you are in the country. But... From President Biden yesterday, it was distinctly clear to me that he should be taking another victory lap. He already has the American Rescue Plan under his hat as a feather in his cap. And now this is really good news about this vac- vaccine, this vaccination that is go- going on and is going on all over the country now. And, you know, he is, as he said last week, um, is looking at 200 million vaccinations being done in this country before this is just incredible I mean I I can't even put this into any kind of words really he's looking to get all of these vaccinations you know over 200 million by I guess is the first 100 days and I think those first 100 days will come at the middle midpoint of April, like the 20th of April or so. Excuse me. And he's um, trying to, or he's declaring that he will be able to get 90% of people who are eligible for vaccination to be vaccinated. Now, if that happens, phew, that would be incredible. And he says by May 1st, you're going to be able to have 90% of people getting getting this vaccine or being eligible for it. I should really stop talking and let President Biden do some talking here. But in this race against the rapidly spreading virus, as fast as we are going, we need to go faster. So to make it easier for Americans to get vaccinated as the supply grows and vaccination eligibility expands, I'm directing my COVID team to ensure there is a vaccine site within five miles of 90% of all Americans by April the 19th, three weeks from today. Look, we're gonna do this by growing from having 17,000 pharmacies giving out vaccination shots to nearly 40,000 pharmacies doing it within the next three weeks. That'll more than double the number of pharmacies where you can go get vaccinated. 
and aren't stopping there. In the next three weeks, we'll add 12 more federally run mass vaccination sites. Every day at these sites, tens of thousands of people are able to drive up, get a vaccine shot while in their car and leave in less than an hour. And over 60 percent of the shots given at these sites goes to minority communities because they're in minority communities. We have to reach out. They're the ones most affected by the vaccine, by both the vaccine, but also by the pandemic. We're also going to send more aid to states to expand the opening, more community vaccination sites. More vaccines, more sites, more vaccinators, all designed to speed our critical work. We also need to make it easier for those who want shots but cannot access vaccination sites to get vaccinated. This is also where we're focused on the seniors most immediately. While we have made incredible progress in starting to vaccinate nearly three quarters of our seniors and now putting vaccination sites within five miles of 90% of all Americans, that still isn't enough as far as we're concerned. We know that there are a number of seniors and people with disabilities who may be isolated and have lack of access to transportation. And there are community groups that can help. They're trying to help now. So our fourth announcement today is that I'm sending out millions of dollars through the Department of Health and Human Service to provide assistance, including transportation, so more vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities can get their shots because they get help to physically get there to get the shot. Neighbors helping neighbors. What a truly American effort. We cannot let transportation be a barrier to any senior getting a vaccination. And so, where does this put us? We're making progress on vaccinations, but cases are rising, and the virus is spreading in too many places still. That's why today... I'm taking these steps to make our American turnaround story, our vaccination program, move even faster. Thanks to all the work we've done these past 10 weeks, the added steps I'm announcing today with them, I'm pleased to announce that at least 90 percent of all adults in this country will be eligible to be vaccinated by April the 19th, just three weeks from now, because we have the vaccines For the vast, vast majority of adults, you won't have to wait till May 1. You'll be eligible for your shot on April 19th. Finally, 10% will be eligible no later than the final 10% will be eligible no later than May 1. And as I just said, due to the steps we're taking today, 90% of Americans will be within five miles of the location where they can get a shot as of April the 19th. So we're moving toward 90-90 by April 19th. That is by April 19th, three weeks from today, 90% of adults, people over 18 and over, will be eligible to get vaccinated. 90% of all Americans will be living within five miles of a place they can get a shot. And of course... It'll take time for everyone to get their appointment. It's a big country. And as fast as we're going, we still have a long way to go to finish this vaccination effort. In fact, we aren't even there. We're only halfway yet. But being at 90-90 just three weeks from today should give hope to the country. Let me close with this. The progress we're making is a significant testament to what we can do when we work together as Americans. But as I've always said, we still need everyone to do their part. We still are in a war with this deadly virus. And we're bolstering our defenses. But this war is far from won. Together we have so much to be proud of in the past three weeks. Past more than three weeks. Past ten weeks. We also have so much to be sorrowful about. Nearly 1,000 Americans a day are still dying from COVID-19 as we approach 550,000 deaths in a single year. Until this country is vaccinated, each of us has to do our part. We have an obligation. 
patriotic obligation. Wash your hands. Stay socially distanced. Wear a mask as recommended by the CDC. And get vaccinated. Get your friends and family vaccinated when you can help. Now's not the time to let down. Now's not the time to celebrate. It is time to do what we do best as a country. Our duty, our jobs, take care of one another and fight this to the finish. We can and will do this, but don't let up now. Don't let up now. Thank you, and may God protect our troops. Thank you very much. So that was President Joe Biden yesterday in that speech that you just heard. Just a portion of it, not all 13 minutes, but a few minutes, definitely, that you heard there, more than five, um, where President Biden was warning about the infection rate rising again, which is what I alluded to near the beginning of this episode. And that this is not a time for people to be letting their guard down. And this is a real problem in this country. People who don't want to be vaccinated for whatever reason. I don't know. Do you know anybody that doesn't want to be vaccinated? Do you know anybody at all who doesn't? Do you have a family member or members who don't want to get vaccinated or who are not going to get vaccinated? I mean, that's something to think about. And if you do, do you speak to them? Do you run interference, intervention? Do you try to talk to them? How do you deal with that if it's a family member who doesn't want to get vaccinated or won't get vaccinated? That's a whole nother story that's not ever been addressed by those in power, except to say that Joe Biden did encourage people to get the vaccinations. But we'll see what happens here, you know. I mean, we shall see. I thought that it was important for President Biden to mention that we are not out of the woods yet. And speaking of which, Dr. Rachel, or excuse me, Dr. Rochelle Walensky went a step further than that. She expressed fears. And and speaking reminiscent to Dr. Nancy Messonnier around that, this same time last year, just about 13 or so months ago now, Dr. Nancy Messonnier, who is the sister to Rod Rosenstein, would you believe, um, sounded the alarm at CDC and said, hey, you know, this is going to be a dangerous virus. It's going to spread. We've got to do everything we can now, but this virus is going to be causing all kinds of problems and havoc. She said that, Dr. Messonnier, and she was in the CDC at the time last year, and she got hounded out of there simply because she told the truth. And now, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, um, at least yesterday, sounded very much the same alarm about any you know sense of resurgence of virus, given all these variants, given all of what's going on, and warned against complacency or celebrating too quickly. You know, I know President Biden may have talked about that as well, but here is Dr. Rochelle Walensky. This is really eye-opening, and I think for those of you out there who are not interested in a vaccine, you really need to listen to Dr. Rochelle Walensky. Listen to this. About two months ago, I made a promise to you. I would tell you the truth, even if it was not the news we wanted to hear. Now is one of those to a seven-day average of approximately 1,000 deaths per day. When I first started at CDC about two months ago, I made a promise to you. I would tell you the truth, even if it was not the news we wanted to hear. Now is one of those times when I have to share the truth and I have to hope and trust you will listen. I'm going to pause here. I'm going to lose the script. And I'm going to reflect on the recurring feeling I have of impending doom. We have so much to look forward to, so much promise and potential of where we are, and so much reason for hope. But right now, I'm scared. Um, I know what it's like as a physician to stand in that patient room, gowned, gloved, masked, shielded, and to be the last person to touch someone else's loved one because their loved one couldn't be there. I know what it's like 
when you're the physician, when you're the healthcare provider, and you're worried that you don't have the resources to take care of the patients in front of you. I know that feeling of nausea when you read the crisis standards of care and you wonder whether there are going to be enough ventilators to go around and who's going to make that choice. And I know what it's like to pull up to your hospital every day and see the extra morgue sitting outside. I didn't know at the time when it would, when it would stop. We didn't have the science to tell us. We were just scared. We have come such a long way. Three historic scientific breakthrough vaccines, and we are rolling them out so very fast. So I'm speaking today not necessarily as your CDC director, not only as your CDC director, but as a wife, as a mother, as a daughter, to ask you to just please hold on a little while longer. I so badly want to be done. I know you all so badly want to be done. We are just almost there, but not quite yet. And so I'm asking you to just hold on a little longer to get vaccinated when you can so that all of those people that we all love will still be here when this pandemic ends. The trajectory of the pandemic in the United States looks similar to many other countries in Europe, including Germany, Italy, and France, looked like just a few weeks ago. And since that time, those countries have experienced a consistent and worrying spike in cases. We are not powerless. We can change this trajectory of the pandemic, but it will take all of us recommitting to following the public health prevention strategies consistently while we work to get the American public vaccinated. I'm calling on our elected officials, our faith-based communities, our civic leaders, and our other influencers in communities across the nation. And I'm calling on every single one of you to sound the alarm, to carry these messages into your community and your spheres of influence. We do not have the luxury of inaction. For our, the health of our country, we must work together now to prevent a fourth surge. Wow. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that, that you know, you need to be told this. <laughs> After my ranting yesterday um, about this, you need to be told this. You really do, dear listener. And um, those people out there who this applies to, I should really say, first and foremost, You really need to listen to Dr. Rochelle Walensky. I mean, it's rare that you get a public official speak like that. And it it was earnest. You could hear it. It sounded like she was going to cry. If you watch the video of this, you will see it looks as if she is going to cry. We cannot let our guard down is my point and is her point. And we have to wear a mask, wear two masks put on a face shield on top of that as well and do everything you can to try to protect yourself. And President Biden's optimism notwithstanding, we've got to do the things that are required to protect each other. We have to. Otherwise, we really will be in at square one again with lots of infections and all kinds of things. And nobody wants this virus. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. And I'm telling you, if you don't want it, then please do everything you can to avoid it by masking up and protecting yourself and washing your face and wearing two masks and away, stay away from the crowds, stay away from all of that. You know, you really do. And make sure your face and mouth and nose are covered, not just your mouth, not just your nose, but your nose and your mouth are covered by a mask. Please. I know it sounds like you're talking to your own child or something or your own, you know, I don't know, kid that you teach at school or something. I am just emphasizing the need to really follow the guidelines of the CDC and also follow the advice of doctors and scientists like Dr. Fauci, who you're going to hear from right now. And I think he further amplifies what Dr. Walensky said. Listen here right now to Dr. Anthony Fauci from yesterday's COVID briefing. Yeah, I'd like to make a few comments over the next couple of minutes that extend what you just heard from Dr. Walensky, and that is the importance of vaccination 
to prevent severe disease and why we cannot pull back on our mitigation efforts. This is a paper from the Annals of Internal Medicine from some time ago, which showed that about one third of people with SARS-CoV-2 infection never develop symptoms. That's the good news. Next slide. Of those who do develop symptoms, about 80% have mild to moderate symptoms, but about 20% or more have severe disease with case fatality rates varying from a few percent to up to 20% for those requiring mechanical ventilation. Now, let me show you something that is very dramatic. If you look at the multi-system manifestations of COVID-19, they are multitudinous. The most important and, and, and common of which is the acute respiratory distress syndrome. But we know now there are neurological disorders, cardiac dysfunction, acute kidney injury, hypercoagulability. Bottom line, this is a very serious disease, which has already led to the death of about 550,000 people in the United States. Next slide. This slide is very dramatic. If you look on the left-hand part of the slide, it's a normal CT scan of the lung. The area that looks black and dark are normal lung because there are air spaces. On the right-hand side of the slide is a patient that I made rounds on at the NIH Clinical Center last week. If you look at this, even a non-physician, non-radiologist can determine that there's something very, very wrong with the lungs on the right-hand side, with the white blotches being infiltration of the lung, that even with the patient being under the top medical care that we're giving them at our hospital, still may very likely have residual scarring of the lung after improvement. Next slide. This is another patient we saw at the clinical center who developed a brain infarct as shown on the left-hand part of the slide with the arrow pointing to the infarcted part of the brain. Bottom line, as Dr. Walensky said in her experience at Mass General, the same at the NIH Clinical Center, this is a very, very bad disease. The fundamentals to prevent acquiring this are the public health measures that Dr. Walensky mentioned, but also vaccination, absolutely critical. Next slide. If you look at the prevention of hospitalization and death among the five vaccines on the left-hand part of the slide, with one exception of a hospitalized patient in the vaccine arm of, a, of the Moderna study, virtually 100% protection against hospitalizations and death. In other words, we can prevent what I showed you on the previous two slides by getting vaccinated. And on the last slide, what you see in red is hospitalizations going down, as in the blue bars, vaccinating people going up. The bottom line, hang in there, as Dr. Walensky said. We really need to hold on to the public health measures as we get more and more people from two to three plus million people vaccinated every day. It will be a race between the vaccine and what's going on with the dynamics of the outbreak and we can win this by just hanging there a bit longer. Again, you couldn't see what Dr. Fauci was saying. You could certainly hear it. But if you look at the video, and I think I should just link to this, if I remember to link it in the line notes, to the whole press conference from yesterday. But you really need to see that video. Oh, gosh. As he just described it about the lungs. Oh, it's so disturbing. It curdles your blood to see the two pictures side by side. Oh, my goodness me. We have got to look out for each other. Otherwise, we will perish. We will perish if we do not do this right with this virus. All these variants and all these strains and these variants, if you walk around here thinking, oh, I got vaccinated so I don't have to wear a mask, think again. Think again. You've got to keep wearing them and for the foreseeable future until this virus is brought under control. So please, we've got to do our part to save each other and save ourselves and practice good discipline and hygiene and good hands washing. It really helps.
and Dr. Fauci, um, wow, I mean, that, that's a strong message, strong message. And that's why he is doing what he's doing. It should be very interesting how we look back at day two, because day two is going on now as I speak, and uh, it may well be actually finished by the time you listen. I'm sure it will be by the time you listen to this episode, but we are in for a really painful next two or three weeks with this trial. Because some of the descriptions are going to just break your heart all over again. And remember, 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 remember. The family whose heart is broken the most and no one else's could be broken as much as theirs is the family of George Floyd. And we must keep him and them in our prayers. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of the politocrat. I am Omar Moore.